So we've been talking for the last few weeks about Israel and how they had uh, came out of the wilderness or came out of bondage. God had led them on this testing tour down through uh, the wilderness into a place called the, the wilderness of sin or Sinai. And there they camped at a great mountain called Sinai. And God was going to use them. They were going to stay camped there for quite a while. And God was going to reveal to them his heart and his, uh, his laws. And tonight, the reason I want you to open your Bibles is because tonight we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. How God gave them to Israel. What they mean to Israel. How they apply to us today. And then thoroughly look, walk through each and every one. Uh, but this is what I wanted to do tonight. Pop quiz. We all think it's very easy. We know them, and I'm sure out of this group, we can get them very easily tonight. But I was, even as I was studying this, and I have taught this countless times to the young people, to the youth, to, my, to the adults. And uh, it was actually, I had to really rack my brain to get all the commandments and get them. We think we know this stuff. If I can tell you a quick story, when we went to Uganda uh, in 2006, I thought I was ready to go and, and witness and, and tell somebody about Jesus and how to be saved. And the first time I got there with that man in the bush that began to try to tell, I made the biggest mess you have ever seen. I wasn't nearly as prepared as I thought I was. Thank God we had an a, a interpreter there, and he was very seasoned, and he, he, he made me look real good that day because I was not as ready as I thought. Sometimes these things that we are taught, that we've known, we store them, they're in our brains, but maybe they're deep down and we can't come up with them. So we're going to try to list the Ten Commandments tonight uh, real quick to start with. Come, somebody tell me the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm just going to paraphrase up here because I can't spell very good. No other gods. That's right. Uh, and we'll talk about what each one of them mean here in just a moment. But the first and foremost commandment he gave was, don't have any other gods before me. What's the second commandment? That's one, but it's not the second. We're going to go in order. That's one. Very good. Not the second. There you go. No graven images, okay? He said, thou shalt have no graven image. Does anybody know what a graven image is? Yeah, it's uh, it's any kind of any kind of statue or figurine or something that you would worship. It's an uh, almost be like an idol too. You you could call it an idol. Um, so no graven images. What's number three? That's one, but it's not the third one. That's one. That's right. It's not the third one though, huh? That's right. It's not the third one. That's one, but the third, the third commandment, yeah. That, that's right, you're right, you're right. You said it right, I'm sorry. I told y'all, thou shalt not, maybe we need to open them up. Take the Lord's name in vain. Very good, thank you, Brother Edward. All right, number four. You might know what the fourth one is. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Very good. <laughs> All right. So we're going to split these up because the first four commandments God gave dealt with man's relationship with who? God, very good. They are all these are between us and God, right? The last six deal with our relationship with who? Others, very good. That is very, very good. So we're going to start up here. Maybe I can put them on. Number five, does anybody tell me what it is? Not that one, almost. That's a good one. That's not five. Huh? There you go. Honor thy father and mother. Remember what it says? Honor. Thy father and mother, that thy days may be long upon the land. And we're going to 
We kind of misquote that here uh, a little bit. We're going to look at that tonight, too. All right, so honor thy father and thy mother. What's the next one? Y'all have said it about three times. There you go, thou shalt not kill. Good job, Kylie. All right, no killing. Number seven. There you go. Uh, no adultery. We're just going to paraphrase. Thou shalt not commit adultery. We're going to talk about what all these are and what they mean, how they apply to us. Number eight. There you go. No stealing. Uh, don't steal. Y'all are really good. All right, number nine. We're almost there. Huh? There you go. Almost. Number nine is thou shalt not bear false witness. That means you don't, don't lie. I'm just going to write it right here. All right, number 10 is thou shalt not covet. Uh, very good. All right, chapter 20 in the book of Exodus. Uh, can anybody tell me for bonus points, where's another place where this talked about? There you go, Deuteronomy. Very good. That's where he talks about that he gives the same things. Does anybody know what Deuteronomy means? Does anybody know what that, that word actually translates out to? The second time. It's the second. Deuteronomy is actually the second giving of the law. How many of y'all know sometimes we need to be reminded about some things? And that's what uh, God was doing in Deuteronomy. That's why it's there. And it's, it's not, a, not a repeat, but he just talking to him again so we're going to look at these like we said the first four dealt with God our relationship with God the last six deals with our relationship with each other and man and um, God wants to he was very serious about this and he gave them and as we'll look it said in verse 20 verse chapter 20 verse 1 and God spake all these words saying I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, this is important, how God starts this. He says he wants to remind them who he was. He says, I am the Lord, what? Your God. He said, I'm your God um, or thy God. He says, I'm not just some God. I'm not just one of those gods that were like fake gods in Egypt that they had hundreds of them. I'm the Lord, thy God. I'm your God, and you are my people. Uh, you, are, you, you are my chosen people. Uh, the, you are the elect that I elected this nation out to put my love upon. And he says, you're my people. And he says, this is what I have done. I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. It's very uh, telling that he needed to remind them what he had done. Hadn't been a long time since they came out. Yeah, it, maybe a year's time now that has passed since they began to cry out and God sent Moses to them uh, to, to lead them out. But he still had to remind them, listen, I'm the God that got you out of Egypt. I heard you cry. I heard you when you cried out unto me to, to deliver you from Pharaoh, deliver you from the bondage that you were in, the burdens you were under. And he said, I have brought thee out of Egypt. And I bought, brought thee out of bondage, out of slavery. He said, but and because I have done this, this is my covenant with you. I'm going to take you to a land that I have promised to thy fathers. I'm going to take you to a land that was flowing in milk and honey. And wherever your foot treads, that's, it's going to be yours. It's going to be your land. But because I've done these things, these are some things I need you to do for me. And this is where we need to look at what the purpose of these commandments were. Can anybody tell me what the purpose of these commandments were to Israel? To do what? To teach them, right. They needed morals. They needed, and listen, these are just the first ten, but there's a lot more than that. Anybody know off the top of their head how many? Uh, it's over 600. I think it's 620 some odd commandments that God gave them and dietary and laws that they had to go. Some of them were dietary. Some of them had to do with cleanliness. Some of them had to do with all different kinds of things. But they were over 620-some-odd that, that God actually gave them. 
these were just the first ten. He said these are the really the, the most important. But if I just gave you these ten, he said the purpose of this law was for you to see and for Israel to see man is, is depraved and wicked at his core. And just these ten little, little commandments they could not keep. So, in other words, the purpose, a lot of the people want to say, well, he gave them this law so they could be holy. And that's right, it was. But the real thing was they need to realize they couldn't keep them, and therefore they couldn't be holy. So, therefore, God had to make a way of sacrifice for them. And they, that's why they had to sacrifice those sheep and the turtle doves for sin offerings uh, in the tabernacles, we'll see, and in, in the temple. That's why, because they could never keep them all. But in the whole point behind this was, this was pointing them where? They couldn't keep it, but it was pointing them to one that, what? Could keep it, right? It was pointing them to a Messiah that was come. Listen, he'd, he'd been prophesied that the Messiah was going to come. And even though you can't keep these, when he comes, he will be able to keep these, and then he will make a new covenant with those people then. This is another question that, that really gets um, thrown around a lot when you start talking about this. And I didn't realize how uh, you get online and start listening to some commentary and reading some, uh, some comment sections on some, boy, there's some folks that, that don't have a clue about what the truth is about this stuff. Do we still have to keep these? All right, I'm, I'm going to give you this. This is kind of a trick question. Do we, can we, do we still have to? No. Can we still keep them? Yes. So, right, you try. That's right. That's right. We're, that's right. We are in a new covenant. This was the old covenant now, right? He gave it to Israel. He gave it to the Old Testament saints. But when Jesus Christ came, he opened a new covenant for you and I. Now listen, a lot of people say, do we throw these away? Absolutely not. No. They're guidelines, they're morals, they're good. But we don't keep them to be holy, okay? That's the thing. In, in this time, God gave them so that they could keep them to be holy. They saw that they could not. So he had to make a way for them to have their sins absorbed and rolled back. And that was by the blood of bulls and goats and those types of things. But when Jesus come, it says he made a one and for all sacrifice, abolishing them, covering all those sins, fulfilling every, uh, every law to every jot and tittle. He fulfilled it completely. He said, I come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And he said, what you could not do in your weakness, in your flesh, I did in my power. I kept them all perfectly. And because of that, now we can rest in his work. And we can still keep them because they are good, because they are moral, because we are to be pleasing unto God. And when we keep these things, we are pleasing unto God. Listen to what, what Jesus says. We broke them all. That's right. It's, it's, and as we'll see when we go through these, it's very easy for us to break these. Uh, I mean, a lot of times we think, well, we're pretty good. I can keep them pretty good. If you start looking at them and dissecting them, we probably break them every day, and we just don't realize it. But listen to what Jesus says in um, chapter John chapter 15. He says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And he goes on to say uh, in, in John chapter 1, First John chapter 4, excuse me, he says this, if, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, that's very, that's very uh, telling there, too, because even after Jesus came, he called us to some higher standards of living, even higher than this in his commandments, Jesus' commandments. Can you mind tell me what Jesus' main commandment was? That you love what? Love one another and love the Lord thy God as thyself and love your neighbor uh, as yourself as well. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and love thy neighbor as yourself. And really, be honest with you, if we keep those, then we'll keep them all. 
And, and Jesus kind of broke it down to make it easier. But he says this, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Not because you have to to be holy, because you love me and you know what I've done for you. Just as Jesus, uh, God said unto these people, I have brought you out of bondage, so now I'm going to give you some, some guidelines, some commandments for you to keep. You should keep them not because of anything other than because of what I've already done for you. Paul says this in Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says this by the mercies of God. He says, I beseech you, I beg you to do these things by the mercies of God, not because you will receive something, but because of what you have already received. He said, by the mercies that you receive every day. How many of y'all are, are, are beneficiaries of Jesus' mercy? Every one of us in this place. And he said, because of his mercies, he says, it's your reasonable service to present your body a living sacrifice unto God. And really, because of what Jesus has already done for us, to try to keep these the best of our ability is good and wholesome. And No, that, doesn't mean, that means you're human, amen? What's that? If you keep my commandments. Right. He, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Let me, let me read that to you so, so you can see it. Um, I didn't mark it in my new Bible, and i got to start marking them better. Um, but he says this. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Oh. Does that mean you don't love him? I don't think so. <laughs> Right. He did. I think I think there's also a thing. There there's sins that you can commit of what there's sins of commission. That means you know them, and sins of omission. That means things that you know that you're not supposed to do, but you commit them anyway. That's, and, and and that just you know that's a direct violation of God's you know love because we break those commandments. But then sins of omission are things that we just do. And are not really conscious of them. We just break them and we do them. Like blind, to blind to it, just not not realizing it. As we'll see when we go through these, we do this very much. So, that, Clyde, what do you think? I think there you go. You're trying to the very best of our ability, right? And, and and this is what I was telling somebody the other day. I said, you know, when we get when we're saved, the Bible says He calls us and He sanctifies us. Yes, Dan. There you go. It's a sanctification. When you get sanctified, that means what? Set apart. But what's our full, what's our goal, our end goal in life is to be what? Be righteous and be made in the image of Jesus Christ, right? To be more righteous, to, to, to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what we're living for. That's what we're being set apart for. But how many of y'all know we'll never get there in this life? But we can get we, we can be a little more like Christ tomorrow than we were today. And that's what's called practical sanctification, where it's a growing process, an everlasting uh, process. That as long as you're living on this earth, you'll be growing. And some days you'll fail. Some days you'll hit it out of the park. Man, you'll do really good. But it's, it's growing. It's growth. It's sanctification. It's, it's getting better. And like Clyde said, I think if you're trying to do these things, you're showing him, hey, I, I love him. But he, as Miss Tiffany said, he knows our hearts. The Bible says he knows the intentions and the thoughts of our mind, the intentions of our hearts and the thoughts of our mind. So he knows that we, we love him. Listen, when he was on the late show, Brother Kevin, out over there with old Peter, what did he ask him? He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, I love you. He asked him again. He said, Peter, do you love me? Lord, yes, you, I love you. 
He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? And it's debatable what he was talking about, talking about the, the disciples or fishing or whatever. But he said, Lord, you know my heart. You know my mind. You know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And he said that all three times. Yeah, he said, you, you know everything. You know my heart. You know I love you, even though I just denied you three times over there. You knew I loved you. He said, I was trying to save my own skin. Yeah, he, I mean, he knew it. He knew it. But it was a confirmation of him. He's like, Peter, I know, I know. Hey, I know you love me. Just go, yes, yes, it's good. And, so, and he knows we love him. And he knows we're trying hard. But he also knows we're human. He knows we're still robed in this flesh. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep, yep. Why was it Jesus asked Peter that three times? I believe, you tell me what you believe first. I'm going to put you on the spot. Why, why do you think he asked him three times? <laughs> God, you're so smart, Clyde. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. He, for the, every time that G, uh, Peter denied Jesus, he reaffirmed Peter by, you love me. You love me. Hey, listen, he was out there by the fire, and he denied him three times, and then he was right there by the fire again, and he told him, he said, I know. He made him say, I love you three times. So in other words, what Peter had done, he made him erase that, all that denying, and publicly he said out loud, I love him. I love him. I love him. And Jesus was like, all right, Peter, you, you, know, you know what to do now take my commandments and love him. So I think it had a lot to do with it. It was three times that he denied him, so it's three times that he made him confess him. But <coughs> God gives them these, these uh, commandments to then go on to, to, to uh, establish a moral code in their, in their lives as well. Uh, how, how do, what's my relationship supposed to look like to you? And what's my relationship supposed to look like to my brother, uh, my fellow man? But I think it's kind of telling, too, that the first four dealt with this, this relationship with us and God, but he was trying to erase from them what Egypt had put in them. Listen, in Egypt, what, how many gods did they have in Egypt? <laughs> we couldn't count them all when we was going through there. Every one of those plays dealt with one of those gods, and there was too many to count. But God has shown through his power, through those, through those plagues, I'm more powerful than any of those. Those are not real gods. And, and, and God is not making it at admission here that there's any other power like him in the universe. He's not saying, I heard somebody say that. Well, isn't God some critic that was trying to be, be crazy? He's like, well, isn't because God said, don't have no other gods before me. Isn't he admitting then that there's another uh, spirit or another entity or deity like him? Absolutely not. That's not what he's saying. He said, I am the one true God. He said, all those other, all those other gods that they served in Egypt, they were phony. They didn't have any power. They were just made up uh, things. But he said, yet they worshiped them. But he said, for you... You can't have any others. I'm the one true God. I'm Jehovah God. And you can't have any other gods before me. Look here. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, who are the biggest ones that the, that the Israelites ended up having trouble with? They struggled with this one. Okay? Let me say this. They struggled as they went on in time. They struggled with this one because who did they worship later on in the conquest, later on when they were trying to, to conquer the land? Who were one that they, they worshipped? Baal. That's right, a Baal god. He was a, a god of a, a false god, but it was a god of the Canaanites, and they, they would fall in with the Canaanites, and they would begin to worship Baal. Remember um, when Elijah was up on the Mount Carmel, and uh, he was having that showdown with the 
400 prophets of Baal, and he said, you know, you call, you call out to Baal and, and have him come down and devour your sacrifice from heaven. And they cried out and cried out and cried out, and Elijah began to make fun of him. He said, well, maybe he's asleep. Maybe y'all need to cry a little louder and wake him up. And when it was Elijah's turn, he said, all right, I want you to take all these buckets and barrels of water and pour it on my sacrifice because to make it wet so it would be hard to light. He said, I want you to put water all around. I want to do these things. And then he prayed out to God, and God devoured it. He showed them who he really was. But they suffered with Baal. Not only that, but there was another god called Ashereth that they went after. He was a god of fertility. So just like those Egyptians were, they would begin to pray to that. So they struggled with that. Now, let me ask you this. How many of, in, in today's time, how many of us struggle with this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we want to think, well, we don't, have, we don't serve other gods. We just come to church and we serve Jesus. So we don't have any other gods before him. But, Lord, is that wrong? Brother, what did you just say? Yourself. Ourself. We, we, can, we can put ourself and our desires and our wants way up there before God's wants and desires for our life, right? Self is a huge one. What's another God that we can serve? Money. Somebody said money. Stuff. Yeah, stuff, material things. Uh, we, 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 we can get so fixated on what we can get and what we can accumulate here. The Bible says, Lay not up for, tre for yourself treasures here on earth where moth and rust doeth break through and steal, or thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust and thieves do not break through and steal. But we, we, have a, we can make that accumulation of stuff be a God. What's some other things? What? Celebrities, absolutely. We can begin to worship celebrities and power, success, huh? Your wife, absolutely. Sports. There you go. That's, what, that's where we're getting forward, Brother Clyde. That's, that's perfect. Anything can be a God before him. Anything that we put before God the Father can be a God that we can break that. Huh? Yeah, absolutely, your phone. I mean, I spend more time with this every day than we do with him. Help us, Lord. You get a flip phone you want. That's good advice, Brother, brother Kevin. Let's just go. all go back to flip phones. <laughs> yeah but anything do you realize that anything we put before him and I'm not just talking about church because a lot of times we'll just say well anything that, I, that keeps me from church that's, that can be considered a God but it's not just church that, that, that is one thing you know a lot of times anything that keeps us from, from coming and worshiping but listen, if all the church we're getting and all the fellowship we're getting with God is what we get here on Wednesday night and Sunday morning, <laughs> we're falling way, way short. But how many times do we fail to spend that time with him in our quiet time or just, just in our communion, in our spirit with him each day? And anything that we put before him, time with our family and our lives and listen our life god loves you to be with your family and your and spend time with your wife and and do those things you are supposed to do those things but we're supposed to put him first in everything in our life and listen this is one he'll make no exceptions for and we won't say oh god and he will forgive us i'm not saying that but what i'm saying is uh we, we say but god i, I had to do this and you know, oh, don't put anything before me. And with the Israelites, they come from a, from a culture in Egypt where they were everywhere, right? Other gods were everywhere. So when their God kind of disappeared up on the mountain with, with uh, Moses in a little while, we'll see as we get there, they, what, did, what was the first thing they had to, thought they had to do? Build one. What did they build it out of? Gold, golden calf, right? They, <clears throat> they said, we've got to build us a God that we can worship uh, because God's gone up there, Moses has gone up there, who knows if they're dying, he's dead, and we're just going to make us a God that we can see. And listen, I think that's where it, where it comes into. 
when when it's something that we need to see and to feel. And the Bible says this, no man has ever seen God. We have it. We couldn't handle it right now. We can't see him or we would die. But how many of y'all know you can sure feel him, amen? You can feel him. We may not be able to see him, but we can feel him. And listen, he's as real as we're sitting here tonight. He's as real as this microphone I'm holding in my hand. And the Bible says in John chapter five, 4, when Jesus was talking to that woman at the well, he says, there's coming a time where everyone that worships me will worship me in spirit and in truth. And that's how we are to worship him today. We may not see him, and I know that makes it hard for us. We may not be able to have an a, 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 a image of him, but we can absolutely feel him and worship him in spirit. Uh, so no other gods before me. Let's do the second one. We're not going to get very far through these, are we? That's okay. The Bible says, "I am the. Uh, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not have any unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or is in the water underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God." visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children of the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, this is very powerful. We need, to, we need to really look at this. When he talks about a graven image, somebody tell me what a graven image is. Well, right. Any kind of image, idol, figurine, a picture, statue, Right? Because they think it's a graven image. Look, can I say this? There's some that, that will go take this to the super extreme. And I think we need to make know the truth about it and, and realize that there, there is a happy medium here. Uh, we don't have an image of God because no man's ever seen God, right? That's why we can't make an image of God. Have you ever seen anybody try to make an image of what God looks like? I mean, not really put up. I've seen some drawings and stuff, but nobody has any ideas, so we can't make a grave. Well, what about Jesus? Everywhere, right? We have an image of Jesus everywhere, and I can't tell you that's the right image that we always see. He probably looks totally different than that, just to be honest with you. But I have no problem with the image. And listen, it's okay to have an image. There's a lot of churches I've heard talk about this, that they wouldn't even have a picture of Jesus up or anything in their church because they say that violates this law but he said listen to this this is where we need to take this down thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above not just god but of anything in heaven above or in earth below or is in the water under the earth that thou shalt not bow down thyself to him or serve them he didn't really say that we can't have an image we just can't serve it and bow down to it. He said, not just of Jesus, not just of God himself, but anything in earth, anything in under the sea. He said, don't make an image of that that you will bow down to and worship. Now, in that day and time, a lot of people did that. They had little idols. They'd have little idol stores in, in, the, in the ancient times where people could go and buy this little graven image or this little wood statue that somebody whittled out and carved out. And they'd take it home, and they'd set it up on their whatever they had back in the day. I don't know if they had a mantle back then or not. But they would set it up somewhere or make a shrine to it in their house, and they would worship that image. And God says, no, cannot do that. That is, that is breaking the first one and the second one, right? Because you're putting something else before me. You're worshiping another God. But not only that, don't nothing that's on here. But listen, I think it's okay for us to have a picture of Christ on a cross. I don't have a problem with that. I have a picture of Christ, but we do not. What we cannot do is bow down and worship that image, right? We worship the spirit that is God. That's who we worship. Not any image, not any, uh, any picture. We, there's no power in that, but where there's power is the spirit. That's where we find the power, and that's where we worship, and that's where we do those things. So... Uh, they, they would do that. Uh, there's a lot of religions in our world, though, that do do that, okay? They, uh, they will 
have, you know, different statues, and they'll bow down and, and pray to those statues and pray to those different images. And God says, no, don't, don't do that. Uh, a lot of occult things have those things that do that. But notice this. He says, if you do that, he says, I'm a jealous God. And he says, I will visit the iniquity, or he's, he's calling that iniquity and sin, wickedness. I will visit that upon the fathers of the, the wickedness of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation. All right. This is one thing that we need to talk about. People get really caught up in this, well, I'm stuck in this generational curse. I've got this, this family curse that's on me, and I can't get right with God because i got this family curse, this generational curse. How many of y'all know at some point somebody can break that? Everybody says, well, see, it says that's, it's, uh, he's going to visit to you. But do you notice that? I left it out just a second ago. But let's read the rest of that. He said, I will visit it unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. So if you continue in the wickedness and the iniquity of your father, do just like he did, and you will get the same judgment visited upon you as your father had. And if you raise your children, there's a very good possibility like that, that they will do that too. What you do is what your children will follow most times. But when somebody finally decides, okay, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of living in addiction. I'm tired of living in, in, in abuse. I'm tired of living in, in, in this chaos. I want the peace of God. And I'm going to break that curse and I'm going to step up. He says, I will continue to visit that upon those that hate me. But when, look at what the next verse says. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Whenever you decide, all right, I'm, I've had enough of that generational curse, I'm going to stop it right now. I don't hate God no more. I love God. I want to come to God. I want to know the truth of God. And, and, and when I do that, I gave my life to God, and I began to love God. Listen, you have broke that generational curse right there. He is a chain breaker. You have the power to do that. You just got to make up your mind to stop that. You got to make up your mind to say, I don't have to be like... They've always been. My family's always been. I don't know who, and listen, if we, if we go back deep enough in all of our families, we probably got some of that, okay? Really, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I can't remember it in my family, but I can't tell you on down the line they wouldn't somebody had, but somewhere along our family line, somebody stopped and said, all right, that's enough. You ain't having that no more. I'm going to love God. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to keep his commandments. And then... Instead of judgment and wickedness being poured out on them, then love and grace and mercy. And he says, I will show mercy unto thousands of them that love me. He says, listen, I, if you hate me, yeah, you're going to get my judgment. But if you love me, I'm going to show, I'm going to pour out my mercy on you. So listen, it, it, there is a such thing as generational curses, but it ain't just because you got to be in it. Listen, just because you've been there before don't mean you got to stay there. Break it. Break it by loving God, giving your life to God, trying your very best to keep his commandments, and he said he'll show his love unto you. We've got a little bit more time. Let's do one more. He says this, not only that, thou, sh thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Let's look at this one. Thou shalt not take the, Lord's, uh, the, Lord, the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. All right, so somebody tell me what this means. Slander, right. I heard somebody explain it this way, and I thought it was very good. Any way that we take the Lord's name foolishly. Foolishly. Now, lots of times we think of this as somebody talking. We've all heard it before. Somebody with the, that needs their rear end beat saying, you know, bad words and, and taking the Lord's name in vain, mixing his name with curse words. And listen, if you ever hear somebody doing that, get a backbone and step up to them and say, you, as long as I'm around here, you're not going to do that. Uh, you know, you can go talk like that myself. I, I had, a, had a meeting with some folks before, and they had uh, began to, to speak that way to me. And I, I said, hold on. Wait just a minute. If we're going to have a conversation, that's fine. But you ain't talking to me like that. 
You're not talking about my Lord like that, and you're not talking to me. I don't let anybody talk to me like that. So if you want to continue to talk, let's talk in a way that is, that is good and, and true, but I ain't, I ain't listening to that. Yes, my God, right, right, right. Right. I, 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 I love God, and I'm not going to allow his name to be slurred like that. But that's what we think about when we think about, think about taking the Lord's name in vain, and that is absolutely right. But any way we take his name in vain foolishly, or we take his name and say it in a foolish manner, we're actually breaking this commandment. How many of y'all have ever um, said, oh, my yeah, I mean, we say that all the time and, 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 and not thinking anything about it. But we really are breaking that commandment when we do that because it's foolish. Or, uh, or you'll hear somebody scream out, you know, um, Jesus' name and, and, and taking it in that way. When something that happened that was scary or frightening them or something, they'll, that is taking the Lord's name in vain. And lots of times, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Man, holy is a, that word is where God owns it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but we don't look at it like that. Like that you're good. Yeah, you absolutely are. Nobody, nobody. But see, this is where we, we have, as a, in our Christian principles, when, as culture has evolved, we have also evolved with culture some, where we have al- allowed things to that once were uh, thought of as being very bad, is not so much being bad anymore. Um, <laughs> Kylie, I can't tell that story out here. <laughs> I will say this. Kylie said, tell them the story. Uh, when we were in high school, we, we got in very much, very bad trouble because we, were, uh, we had a homecoming parade, and the seniors were goody-two-shoes, and they always did everything right, and our class always done everything wrong. We were the black sheep of the school at that time. And let me say this, I think there's five preachers that come out of our class, amen, so don't judge a book by its cover, amen. Uh, sometimes God's doing something you, ain't, you don't know about. I know we was heathens back then, but that don't mean God can't change you, okay? He break that curse. curse, that's right. But we, were, we, 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 had, we thought we had the best float of the all homecoming. I mean, it was awesome. We had smoke and dry ice and everything else. And we lost, and the, and the seniors won. So we decided to, to hang a sign outside our door. And I'm not going to say it's not a super bad word. Something that is very, very accepted now. Your kids probably say it all the time. You probably say it all the time. It was something that, that is just normal lexicon now. But we hung that sign out there that said that about the seniors. And when I say we got in trouble, we got in trouble. We had to write a, a, an apology letter to the town of, of Bowden at that time, have it posted in the newspaper because it was deemed to be so bad. But right now, it's used everywhere. I can't tell you that. I'm, I ain't going to do it. I ain't got trouble for it one time. Amen. <laughs> I'm not telling you. See me after class, I'll tell you, okay? See me after class. It's not bad now, but, but listen. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll just see me after class, I'll tell you, okay? It's not that bad, okay? Don't think bad about your preacher, but... <laughs> no. But we got in very much trouble for it. I mean, very much trouble. And now nobody thinks anything about it because culture has changed a little bit. We just accepted that. That's, that's become part of our dialogue now. Nobody, huh? Our standards have changed, right. Right, right. And that's exactly what it is. Edward, you're very right. It's the Laodicean church age. It's, it's the, if you want to go read about that in Revelation, do that. But our standards have just changed, okay? So the same things that we, we, do, we think about, maybe in 1950 they would have had you stand up from the church and give an acknowledgement before. Now people just say, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. In, in special in our in the what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. 
Well, I mean, that's the thing. We, we've seen how much change that, that, that has tried to go that way. I think, I think society is wising up to some of that really far-left, woke stuff. But by the same time, we as the church have just accepted a lot of things and said, nah, not that big a deal anymore. But it really is to God. It's no different from God then as it is now. But we should be very mindful and very careful about how we talk about God. And uh, Brother Edward said about how we use holy terms, terms that, that, that should only describe a holy God. But, yeah, it's a lot different than when it Clyde. A lot different, yeah. Couldn't shoot you in gum. Yeah. I think I, yeah, I done some research one time when I was preaching a message about it, and they said that in 1950, the greatest problem they had in their schools was kids running in the hall was number one, and chewing chew and gum was number two. Yeah, he's shirt tail. <laughs> but n- nowadays it's just different, right? But yeah. Right. But to get back to our point and we'll finish up, we need to be very con- you know, conscious of how we use God's name and do it in a holy manner, in a good manner, because to God it is taking his name in vain for us to say uh, things, not just cursings. We should never do that, ever. Listen, um, I think one of the biggest things that changed in my life when God revived me. Now, listen, I was a heathen. I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I'm not bragging about it. I wish I would have never been that. But I was a construction worker. I worked on construction sites. And I taught like every construction worker taught for a long time. When God changed my heart and changed my life, that's the first thing I prayed for him about fixing on me. Can't tell you he done it overnight, but he fixed it. And uh, he fixed it. But when I stopped talking like that, I began to realize how awful everybody else sounded talking like that. And I thought to myself, man, I can't believe I used to to do that. And and it was all manner of curse words, taking the Lord's name in vain. Some, I was raised not to do that, and I didn't do that much, but I can't say I never did that. And that's something that I have to ask God to forgive. I had to ask God to forgive me for. But these things, we realize how we sound and especially if we are a professing Christian and we are trying to witness to somebody and then maybe when they're not around, they hear you talking in that way, your testimony ain't got no power with them. Your witness has no power with them. So uh, be very careful. Huh? That, no adultery. Yeah. We're going to get into it pretty heavy when we get there. But, uh, yeah, it, it's a lot more than what you think it is. It's a lot more than what you think. And, and listen, what I was trying to get you to see, all these are a lot deeper than they look like on the surface, okay? Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Well, I, don't, I don't curse with God's name. But when we get to looking in it deeper, we realize we probably all break that one too. Not not knowingly or not willingly, but just out of habit we've we've done. Right, that's right. Great great definition. He said the word vain actually means useless. And it means that you're not given when you use God's name in that way, it's not uh, attributing his worth to to what he he is and the holiness. He says slander, slandering in his name. And, uh, yeah. Well, you should you should have just took her a soap biscuit, amen. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Listen, we 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 really need to 
to be aware, though. I mean, it really is a serious thing to God. We may not think it's a serious thing, but to God it really is. And it affects our relationship with Him, whether you believe it or not. The way we, we talk about God and to God and to others about God really affects our relationship with Him. So next week, we'll, we'll, we'll try to go through these. And uh, I keep telling you, we'll get all, through, all the way through them next week because, as you can see, this is very in-depth and, and very telling. Uh, but be conscious. Just try, if, if you can do nothing else here this week, just try to be conscious of how we speak uh, to God and about God. Be conscious of the other things, not putting anything else before God, and, uh, and, and go from there. And I promise you, you will see a difference in your life when you begin to try to be, begin to live these these things. Will you be perfect in it? Absolutely not. But listen, listen. Like we talk about, God knows our heart. And he'll love us and he'll show us mercy because we do those things. Anybody got any else? Anything else? <laughs> well, I, I got very convicted in my heart before I, when I was studying this about those that, that I had committed just today. How many do you think we wrote tonight? Every one of them probably, yep. That's right. That's right. You're right. They all build upon one another, right? So if we're breaking that one, we probably have no chance of keeping the rest of them. If we're keeping all them, yeah, we'll, we'll, it just, they build upon each other. And they are, and, and that's purposely done. God knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty, he knows what he's doing. So, We'll continue to look at that. Thank you for being here tonight. I, I love this time. I hope this is is helpful to you, like it's helpful to me. Listen, I I don't know, I don't have a whole lot of knowledge, but this Bible's full of it, and I hope it it can help you to understand it and and desire to want to live it, because it, it will absolutely make a, a change in your life. Let's stand at our feet tonight. We'll be dismissed. Thank you all for being here. Come out. Don't forget Saturday morning, men. Anybody that can come help. I'm going to set up the uh, nativity across the road. I got the bags today to, to bag the wood back here. Uh, we'll have a skid steer here to hold those up. We're just going to have to toss them over in the bag till we get it full. So uh, if anybody can come do that, it won't take a long time to do any of those things, especially if we've got a lot of help. So uh, come out if you can, 8.30 Saturday morning. We'll get it done as fast as possible so it doesn't use up your Saturday. But if you can come, please do that. No church next Wednesday. Thank you, brother. Uh, brother Randall for that. Next week will be Thanksgiving week. No church next Wednesday night. Okay, no youth or adult. So we'll have to wait an extra week. Just uh, study extra hard, and then we'll, we'll get into it, okay? All right, anybody got anything else? Thank you for reminding me about that, Randall.